Uh, good afternoon, Sarayim Tov. Uh, Sarayim Tovim? <laughs> Grammar was never my strong point. Uh, um, my name is Rella Geffen, and I graduated from the Teachers Institute in 1965, which was a very good year, with many people who were better in grammar than I. Um, and, and this session is uh, kind of a living memoir of two distinguished persons. Well, I guess you're both educators in a way in the Jewish community, stretch, but. Um, <laughs> who grew up in Hebraist homes. Uh, but before I introduced them, I, just, I decided I had the right to tell one anecdote. So I decided on an anecdote about Hebrew language in the uh, Teachers Institute slash Seminary College. And uh, one of our very beloved teachers in the 1960s, and he was here earlier, but I think he left, is Avram Holtz. And we, abs we would do anything, he said. He was devoted to the students, and he was just beloved by them. And he also told the best stories late at night uh, at uh, camp and in various places. So he was given the task of teaching the first year students to read Hebrew without vowels. Now, I don't want you to think that the Seminary College Teachers Institute students were so much better in Hebrew because it just came naturally. Everybody worked very hard at it. It was a priority. And that's why this anecdote seems to fit with the session. So Avram thought and thought, uh, this may be a revisionist version of how he did this. And he tried to figure out how to get us to practice reading Hebrew without vowels. And he took a book that had been written by a uh, Bible educator in Israel named Tzvi Adar. And the, ah, I see people nodding, okay. And it was a book in Hebrew, in Ivra, about uh, the literary approaches to the Bible and how to teach them. And his way of teaching us to uh, become perfect at reading Hebrew without vowels was that we memorized the book. We memorized the book and we said it to each other. And to, is Nancy still is here? Nancy Messner? I, we can still recite the first paragraph. Uh, and, and the truth is that we loved that class. And to this day, I cannot understand how that happened or how anybody could ever replicate it. But there was something about the bond between the students and the teacher that made such an amazing thing possible. But I can tell you that students in the joint program found that mastery of Hebrew was more difficult than all of their Columbia courses combined and all of their other seminary courses combined. And their first two years, they worked harder at that than anything else. But it was a real tircha. OK. So now for those who learned the natural way, uh, we have here a distinguished uh, literary person who I've been lucky enough to work with from time to time over the last couple of years on the uh, Roar Literary Prize, Nessa Rappaport who is a wonderful writer, and who even in her book about Shabbat wrote about Camp Ramah quite a bit. If I, rec I read it many years ago. Uh, and uh, we're very, very happy that she's here today. And Shuli Rubin Schwartz, who is the current dean, uh, and you already heard about how important deans are, uh, the current dean of List College, and uh, who apparently also grew up in a Hebraic home. I mean, I have been in that home, but I didn't realize that you grew up speaking Hebrew. So they are going to dialogue with each other, and then eventually they'll let you know when you can come into the dialogue. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Rilla. Uh, Shuli and I met and tried to choreograph um, as far back as our memories or stories could take us. So we're going to try to go back and forth, starting with our great-grandparents, uh, to try to express the story of what it meant for families of several generations to be madly in love with Hebrew and try to communicate that to the succeeding generations. My paternal great-grandfather, Rav Tuvia Goodman HaKohen Rappaport, was a lover of epigrams. A composer of poetry in Yiddish and Hebrew, he devoted his life to the creation of a concordance of references to Eretz Yisrael and the Tanakh. Yiddish is my mistress, he would say, but Hebrew is my wife. 
It was my mother's uncle, Rabbi Gershon Levy, a JTS graduate and translator of Chaim Chazaz, who gave me the Canadian poet A.M. Klein's novel, The Second Scroll. He held before me Klein's example as a pioneer in deeply engaged, Jewishly literate English language poetry. The inscription to me as a Jewish writer is in English, but the date, which I checked this morning, is Sof Yemei Hasvira. Almost half a century later, Klein, an agnon of English, continues to represent to me a beacon of the possible. The project of Hebrew in America was bound to the exhilarating project of the creation of a Jewish state. When my father's aunt, Bella Rappaport Miadovnik, left her beautifully furnished apartment in Warsaw to follow her new husband to impoverished Palestine, her in-laws importuned her father in Canada to intervene, this same great-grandfather. My paternal great-grandfather wrote back, better that a daughter of mine should starve in the streets of Eretz Yisrael than live in plenty in the streets of Poland. Because of my great-uncle Moshe's brave enchantment with Eretz Yisrael, Bella was not murdered in the Shoah, as her sister Tsipola was which is how, half a year after I met Shuli at Mador in Camp Ramah, Palmer, I could fly to Israel for the first time in my life, meet Bella and Moshe on my first night in Jerusalem, and speak to them with fluent ease, bequeath the gift of Hebrew by my mother's passion for Jewish literacy and our attendant enrollment in Jewish day schools, the non-negotiable condition of her acceptance of my father's proposal of marriage. It was my decades-long love of Bella, cultivated over countless visits to Israel, that gave me the bridge of language, culture, and Yiddishkeit that allows me to retrieve continually the Rappaport legacy of Yichus and intoxication with sacred text. My great-uncle Shapsa pledged his troth to Yiddish, I learned, while my grandfather Srulka, Ilui in Poland, grocer and milkman in Toronto, could pore over a Gemara for the pleasure of learning after a backbreaking day and write letters in both Yiddish and Hebrew to his son in New York. Um, as we heard today uh, at lunch when Issa spoke, and as I look around the room and see many of you, um, for those of us um, who were privileged to grow up in a Hebrew-speaking home with this uh, environment, it kind of feels like a little club um, and I guess we're trying to kind of crack the code of that club. My story also begins with my uh, great-grandfather on my uh, mother's side, our own Shimon Spal. He was born in uh, Bielozerka, Russia in 1875, and according to the family genealogy scroll, he was educated in Torah and Hasidut. He worked in a progressive Jewish school and eventually became principal of a gymnasium, which was uh, unusual for a Jew at that time um, to uh, have that credential from the Russian government. He lived in the town of Kremenitz, a town of about 30,000 people, which had al already a long history of being associated with the Haskalah and with Zionism. Uh, in the uh, Yisker book for the town of Kremenitz, we find in Hebrew that the home of Aaron Shimon Shpal was the first in which Hebrew was the spoken language, the first in the town. So he was the Eliezer ben Yehuda of Kremenitz. <laughs> um, he spoke Hebrew to his three daughters and his son and his wife, Shalamis, my tell, my whom I am named after. Um, she supported his uh, love and sp speaking of Hebrew, but she spoke Yiddish to make sure that the kids knew both Hebrew and Yiddish. As a result of the pogroms immediately after World War I, he decided it was time to get out of there. He was on his way to Denver, Colorado, because he already had siblings there, and they sent him money to, to go. And uh, I have a uh, beautiful entry from his diary in which he describes the anguish of this journey. Let me share some of it with you. Yes, I dreamt sometimes of leaving this country, but for the sake of, a di of an entirely different country, of that country to which I'm bound historically, 
love for which I had sucked in with my mother's milk, for the restoration of which I have worked all my life. I dreamt of leaving this country for the sake of that country, which, although I was never there, every corner of it is well known to me and loved by me, each name as of those names that are mentioned in the Bible sounds so sweet in my ears. Hevron, Yerushalayim, Beit Lechem, Petach Tikva, Rishon Litzion, Merchavia. How beautiful, how charming are those names. And suddenly, America? What does the name say to my soul? What relation to me has Denver, Colorado, where I am going to? He continues this angst in his journal, and this is the one entry of his diary that he translated into English. So this is his English from, of course, the Hebrew. He, he notes regretfully, he's writing this on, on, while he's traveling to Warsaw, and there are some who are going to Palestine and some who are proceeding to America. And he notices that those going to Palestine are so happy and joyful. As he said, the, the, uh, hash, the shechina seemed to radiate from their countenances. And he, of course, was going to the United States, which in, to which he says, I belong to the second category, the one coming to the United States, to the small one. I become insignificant in my own eyes. Yeah. So how does he reconcile the fact that his soul yearns for Palestine and he was going to Denver? He says, thus we made up a compromise. Everybody's voyage is not in vain we'll all be engaged in furthering our national aspiration. In different ways, we'll work for one purpose. Our good humor awoke, our faces cleared up, we promised another not to haul down our national flag, and with the song Hatikva, we arrived at Warsaw. There we bade each other a hearty farewell. The, Palest the Palestine pioneers went to the Palestine office and we, as American pioneers, went to the Hayas, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. So in his, in his mind then, both were halutzim, mm -hmm. those going to Palestine would work the land, and our own Shimon Shpal would work the mind and the spirit in the United States. When the Norton Book of Jewish American Writing was published, I was invited to review it for the Los Angeles Times, which meant that I had to immerse myself in centuries of Jewish writing, much of it unfamiliar. For the first time, I encountered captivating Yiddish poets and thinkers whose names I had not known. One striking ode to Hebrew and to Jewish education in America was written by Ephraim Lisitsky, who said with striking prescience in his 1949 memoir, first published in Hebrew and then in English a decade later, quote, in the years I have lived in America, I have witnessed the continuing growth of a flourishing Jewish community, a community destined to exert a decisive influence on the rest of the Jewish diaspora. No less substantial is bound to be its share in the upbuilding of Eretz Israel through the contributions of its wealth and energy True, this amazing growth has been mainly in the material sense. Yet material growth is not unrelated to spiritual growth. Those same vital forces, so creative in the material sphere, are equally effective in the realm of the spirit. And to foster this creative process is the great mission of Jewish education in this country. A great and difficult task indeed, but wholly within the bounds of possibility. Although I did not grow up in a Hebrew speaking home, as Shuli did, I cannot remember a time when the romance of Hebrew was not intrinsic to my Jewish life. My maternal grandmother, Mattie Rotenberg Levy, founded the first progressive Jewish day school in Toronto, the Hillcrest Progressive School. Among her express purposes was to confer upon her five children the gift of access to the Hebrew language. She would recount that when she tried to entice prospective parents to send their children to Hillcrest with one hour of Hebrew a day, 
they would respond, why should my children learn Hebrew? They're not going to be rabbis. The Schmal family arrived in Denver in May of 1922. My great-grandfather didn't last in Denver very long. He uh, made a trip to New York to try to find some job prospects where he met Ephraim Lisitsky, the famed uh, Hebrew poet. Ephraim Lisitsky at the time was the principal of the commun communal Talmud Torah in New Orleans. So my great-grandfather picked up the family and they moved by Sukkot, they moved to New Orleans. He became first, uh, first a teacher and then the assistant principal, working with Lisitsky to realize their common dream of uh, cultivating a rich Hebrist enclave in the southern city of New Orleans. He poured tremendous energy not only into the school, but also into his own family rearing children who spoke Hebrew and who were committed to furthering the national movement in their own adult lives. As you might imagine, he had, he had three daughters and one son, and so he invited any eligible young Jewish man, particularly one who spoke Hebrew, into his home. And my uh, grandfather, Jacob Perlstein, a 1920 graduate of the Teachers Institute, was at that time in medical school at Tulane. So it didn't take long for him to uh, be invited into the home. And of course, they were overjoyed when he married the eldest daughter and took her to New York. At that point began what became a regular regimen of letter writing uh, to his children in New York from 1930, at the time of their wedding. He wrote uh, every day except for Shabbat, three times a week in Hebrew, and uh, three times a week in Yiddish. In one of his letters, he articulated his devotion to Hebrew and helped, helped articulate what he put in each letter, what he decided to write in Hebrew and what he wrote in Yiddish. This is what he wrote. This is my translation. The Hebrew language is different from all other languages. What is especially different is our relationship to it. In every other language that we write, we're not so careful about the beauty of the language. And if on occasion we commit an error in grammar or style, it's of no matter. This is not the case with our language. It's called the sacred language, and our ties to it are like they are to everything sacred. Everything that we write or prepare to write, it's with reverent awe. Even I, for whom the language f flows freely from my mouth, and especially from my pen, even so, I use the language only in serious times. And even the secular su subjects I write about in this language are pulled by a thread of holiness. And if I want to recount what's new matters, or things that don't require close attention, I use Yiddish. In this language, I'm not careful. Sooner or later, I rely on my pen. In the hours that are in Hebrew, I watch my pen so that nothing goes out that is not corrected. It was an article of faith that all 19 of my maternal grandparents' grandchildren would attend Jewish day schools, a commitment in the 1950s that was rare and subject to critique by other Jews we knew, but one that also made it possible for me to get the lead in Heidi, the play in Camp Ramah that was in Hebrew, as all plays were, because at Ramah, day school kids were the elite. Only as an adult have I come to understand that my access to Jewish text is an unearned gift. That is, my parents' commitment to Jewish education opened to me the Jewish past in its wealth and intricacy and made it possible for me to devote my writing life to embedding in English the sacred texts and language that have sustained me as a writer and as a person. I adored my paternal grandfather who died when I was five. My father, eminent physician and pioneering Jewish clinician in a hospital that had to decide if Abe Rappaport was the right Jew to be the first, to break the barrier was as a child sent to the incomprehensible cheder of his day. My grandfather despaired when my father elected to play ball on the street 
rather than acquire the literacy that the cheder was in any case ill-equipped to give him. But my father entirely supported my mother's passion. I cannot count the number of times I heard him say with wistful longing as he watched us do our mikraot gedolot homework, if only my father could have lived to see you girls, it would have given him so much nachas. My mother is the only native-born North American Jew I know who, without her having spent extended periods in Israel when she was young or becoming an academic, reads Hebrew novels fluently for pleasure. On her bedside always is a Hebrew novel and dictionary. Even when she went in for minor surgery, she took to the waiting room not People magazine, as I would have, but a Hebrew novel. She is part of a monthly Agnon group in Toronto and was in a monthly Hebrew novel reading group as long as I can remember. When I told her I was participating in the anniversary celebration today, I asked her if she would write for me a brief history of her love of Hebrew, beginning in Hillcrest Progressive Day School, founded by her mother. As is her wont, she demurred, but I coerced her, and so I will cite her words directly. This is my mother speaking. Just as I can't remember a time when I couldn't read English, so I can't remember not being able to read or decode Hebrew. Although I do recall learning the letter chet in kindergarten because we called it the sore throat letter. I also remember that in grade seven, my last year in the school, we had only one hour of Hebrew a day. And I think that was true every year. And that we had advanced to learning a short form of bray sheet with a few lines of Rashi in regular script. After leaving Hillcrest, I had Hebrew lessons with various teachers almost all through my high school years. When I was turning 12, I asked my father for what I thought was an impossibly expensive birthday present, an English Hebrew, Hebrew English dictionary. As an adult, I can understand how delighted he must have been at my request. I still have that dictionary, much the worse for wear, although it has been superseded by others. Naively, I thought that the dictionary would enable me to learn to speak Hebrew. A few years later, when I joined the class taught by Abraham Shkop, the legendary teacher at the Talmud Torah, where the language of instruction was Hebrew, I met a student who had actually memorized all the words in his Hebrew dictionary. In 1948, he and another alumnus of the Talmud Torah joined Machal and fought in the Israeli War of Independence. Where my desire to speak Hebrew came from, I am not quite sure. I know that for a few years during the Second World War, I belonged to a Chugivri, where the members were all students of the Talmud Torah and where the language of the meetings was Hebrew. In 1946, when I was 18, at the end of my first year in university, a New York cousin of mine told me that she had been to a Hebrew-speaking summer camp called Yavne, which was under the auspices of the Boston Hebrew College. I applied and was accepted as a CIT. We spent three hours in the morning in classes, and I, who had a pretty good background in Tanakh with some seafruit, but very poor speaking and listening skills, found myself able to realize my dream. We had a class in Yeshayahu taught by a gifted teacher, Dr. Wechter from Gratz College, a class in the structure of Tefillah taught by Rav Solomon Wind of Yeshiva University High School in New York, and a class in Agnon. That Agnon class resulted the next winter in an exchange of Hebrew letters with a classmate in the style of Agnon, or what we thought of as the style of Agnon, full of lots of Tanakh phrases throughout the following winter. I now wish that I had kept those letters. Meantime, throughout the summer, with a lot of determination and with the help of a notebook and pencil always in my pocket to write down new words as I heard them and words to be learned that I needed but didn't know, after eight weeks I was able to chatter in Hebrew and I remember even dreaming in Hebrew. I then understood why toddlers chatter all the time because of the sheer delight in being able to do it. I also switched that summer from Ashkenazi to Sephardi pronunciation. Incidentally, in my class that summer are a few names that you will recognize from the Jewish academic world. Yitzchak, known later as Isidore Tursky, Avraham Band, and Baruch Levine, all 15 years old at that time. They were among those boys who got up an hour early every morning to study Talmud. Incidentally, at Yavne, the girls had tefillah every morning, separate from the boys, where the chazanit was a girl, as were the Torah readers, with none of the misgivings about women's minyanim that arose in later years with the rise of feminism. Back in Toronto, I persuaded my parents to send my two younger brothers to Yavne. 
For the next two summers, I was a counselor and had time for only two classes in the morning. But I learned enough to be given advanced standing when I applied to the Teachers Institute at the seminary in 1949, starting in the third year instead of the second. Sylvia Attenberg was in charge of the TI students then. One of my favorite teachers was Avraham Halkin, whose Hebrew language was impeccable and whose classes in Jewish history were most interesting and enjoyable. Toward the end of that first year, Sylvia Attenberg met with the TI students and recruited a number of us as counselors for Camp Ramah in the Poconos, where we were both teachers and cabin counselors. That was the extent of my Ramah experience until 1961, when my husband came home one day telling me that Camp Ramah in Canada had put a notice in the hospital looking for doctors for the summer. I persuaded him to apply, which was the beginning of the 11 summers of our spending his four-week summer holiday at the camp north of Toronto. Our four daughters joined the camp cabins in turn as soon as they were old enough. There I had the leisure to start reading Hebrew again. I managed about one book per summer, hard going at first because modern Hebrew without vowels was much harder than Tanakh. Later, I joined a seafood group in Toronto made up almost exclusively of Israelis, which forced me to read five or six current Israeli novels each year. This I did with the aid of a dictionary, the successor to my 12th birthday present. Now I read Hebrew books, but am still stymied by acronyms and current Israeli slang, as well as by English words written in Hebrew. I'm always looking in vain for the Sharesh. <laughs> and so the struggle goes on. Nessa, I hope this will give you enough material for your talk at the Teachers <laughs> Institute celebration. Please give my warm regards to Sylvia Ettenberg. I too wondered how what began with my great-grandfather filtered down to my grandparents and my parents and then me. Some of the, the uh, hints of that come out in the letters that my great-grandfather was writing to my grandparents because, um, and, I, and I got a sense of the things when you, you know, I joked before about Eliezer ben Yehuda, but when you read the early materials about him, and the um, obstinacy that goes into speaking Hebrew when no one else in the world is doing so, um, you get a lot of that that comes through in these letters as well. He would offer hearty praise and fierce admonition at the same time in these letters. For example, he would write, you have done well reading the newspaper that you got, Hadoar, together. Take it upon yourself as an obligation to do this every week. He also would cajole them, asking every couple of weeks, when will you start writing letters in Hebrew to me? Help each other, and what one lacks, the other will supply. Again, when my grandfather expressed reticence about writing in Hebrew because after all it had been 10 years since, since he had been at the Teachers Institute. He said, I can answer with only one word, will. Where there's a will, there's a way. You have to decide that once a week or once every other week you must write a letter in Hebrew. Take it upon yourself, extract a promise. I write to you three times a week, mm -hmm. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And there were times when welcome and unwelcome visitors showed up at our house occasionally and interfered with my letter writing. Or other matters came up that could not wait for me to deal with. But I live up to my rules. I am writing my letter in its time, on Friday, in Hebrew. Look at me and do the same. <laughs> Glad he was my great-grandfather and not my father. <laughs> uh, you both write a beautiful Hebrew. I save Jacob's letters still, and I enjoy them. And Edith excels in the art of writing. Nothing is lacking except for will. Fortify your will, and everything will turn out well. And the essential part is to set aside a day. On such and such a day, you must write Hebrew. And it needs to be a rule that cannot be breached. When my mother was born, Gila, uh, my grandparents chose to speak Hebrew to her, just as 
uh, her parents had, her father had spoken Hebrew when she was born. Of course, my great grandfather was overjoyed, but again, he quickly offered unsolicited advice. I was so happy to hear that you've already started to speak Hebrew to her. Well done, but I want to know your method. <laughs> Are you speaking to her only in this language? Or are, you, or are you mixing up the languages? And sometimes using the holy tongue and sometimes English. If so, you'll have nothing to show for your efforts. <laughs> <laughs> you will be confused and the little one will be confused. You must make speaking Hebrew to her mandatory and not optional, fixed and not temporary. Then the little one will grow up and the language will be with her. Again, in another letter, he reinforced his message, my joy is doubled in knowing that you've gotten accustomed to turning to her only in Hebrew, and her ears absorb only the sounds of our language. Continue on this path, and you will be successful. They were indeed successful with my mother. She clearly overlapped with Nessa's mom at the Teachers Institute and at Ramon the Poconos. First, she uh, studied at Herzliya, one of the, we would now call them Hebrew high schools, uh, Hebrist, Zionist uh, Hebrew high schools in New York City, then came to the Teachers Institute. She attended Brooklyn College, but um, after she married and became pregnant with me, um, I guess, uh, she couldn't quite manage both degrees, and it was crystal clear to her which degree was more important. She graduated the Teachers Institute, never quite finished Brooklyn College. She uh, worked at Beit HaYeled, one of the uh, Hebrew immersion preschools, we would call them now, and Rella was one of her preschool students. Um, her, she adored her classes in Hebrew, also Avraham Halkin, Hillel Bavli, she was in her element here. She met my dad here. He was in the rabbinical school. Uh, but she was the Hebrew speaker of the family. Her Hebrew was much stronger than his, having of been he went to the reared. Rabbinical school. Not only because he went to the rabbinical <laughs> school, also because it had been, as you heard, her first language. And she, in turn, uh, spoke Hebrew to me and my siblings, something that also made us feel part of a very elite group not only in our Orthodox yeshiva, where our Hebrew was much stronger than that of our peers, but certainly at Camp Ramah as well. We, we, we didn't tell each other what we were going to say, but <laughs> what I'm about to say about my mother perfectly interleaves with oh, what you nice. just said, which is to say, <laughs> it is a delight for me to pay tribute to my mother's lifelong ardor for Hebrew. Unlike the children of immigrants, I am far less adept than she. At least to date, I have lacked not the passion, but the quality my father would frequently enjoin his four daughters to deploy, zitzfleisch. <laughs> Still, although I write in English, both the diction and the cadence of my work belongs to Hebrew. The chant of Hebrew, of liturgy, poetry, and the words I have said daily, weekly, and annually since I was a child is the music of my writing and my purpose. I am in love with the infinite texts of this astonishing inheritance, law, myth, parable, argument, and praise. Because of the legacy of my father and my mother, I understood when I set out to be a Jewish writer that although the Jewish novel had in the past been a book for Jews, about Jews, and even against Jews, it could also resonate with Jewish language and draw its structure, mode of thought, and allusions from the Jewish books that came before it. For me, an ancient and still too obscure literary tradition, the words shaped by the mouths of my people could be art. My writing life has been dedicated to that vision which continues to entrance me. And I thought that before Shuli and I talk, I would give two very small examples of what I mean. One from the start of my writing life and my first novel and one much more recent. Uh, in my first novel, I wanted to find language that was not banal to describe the encounter between a young woman and her first love, to describe a lovesick girl and who, who sees a boy as if he were divine. And I could not 
keep writing, although I had been writing very fluently until that point, because everything that came out sounded like a Hallmark card. <laughs> Words could not describe, etc. And then I suddenly realized that if I hitchhiked a ride on these sources that I had such access to anyway, I could take advantage of thousands of years of grace of language and just they could carry me and my heroine. And so uh, what I heard in my head was the chant of Hebrew, the Hebrew I said every week on Shabbat morning, Ilufinu male shirakayam, if our mouth were as full of song as the sea, a phrase from the beautiful prayer that begins, Nishmat kochai, let the breath of all that lives praise your name. I changed the pronoun in the phrase, for I was not speaking of the people of Israel, blessing the one in whose image we are made, but of the lovesick girl. And I wrote, if her mouth were full of song like the sea, and her tongue rejoicing like the rushing waves, and on her lips praise like the breath of heaven, her eyes the sun, the moon, her arms outstretched like the sea eagles, her feet delicate as gazelles, still it would not be enough to hold what happened then. That was the beginning for me of what it felt like to be able to have access to these sources. And once I found it, I could not understand why every Jewish writer in America wasn't doing this. I mean, it was. <laughs> and then finally, more recently, I actually, um, there's probably nothing I've written that doesn't have something of my favorite Jewish text in it, which is Shir HaShirim, the Song of Songs, to the point where my friend Tom likes to joke, no more myrrh, but there will always be myrrh in my writing. Uh, so I will conclude this part of our presentation by reading something very recent, which is uh, the following. My husband, Toby Khan is a painter and sculptor. I know you have some work of his here. His vocabulary is entirely visual. New York born, he likes to say that English is his second language. I live for English to write it, read it, and savor it on my tongue. Several years ago, Toby invited me to write the meditations that would accompany the museum show of his ceremonial art. I said no, and then yes. The voice that emerged in the prayers I created honors my rabbinic ancestry, my devotion to English literature, and my passion for Hebrew texts, especially the Song of Songs, whose ravishing words anticipated my first love and accompany my love for my husband until, and perhaps after, who can say, I meet the one in whom my soul delights. It's beautiful. Thank you. I will end on a less poetic note. I can't begin to approach the poetry either of my uh, colleague and friend or of my great-grandfather. But on a more mundane note, uh, in talking about my own life and uh, my own children, I, I guess um, I too felt completely inadequate to the task of uh, speaking Hebrew to my children in the way that my parents and grandparents and great-grandparents had done. I was fortunate in that my late husband, Gershon, although his um, ability in Hebrew was slight, his ardor <laughs> was deep. <laughs> and he, um, he was one of those boys at Ramah who took the Hebrew thing very, very seriously. He learned Hebrew um, by um, using the songs of Naomi Shemer. Um, he would, he would uh, sit there with a dictionary and every one of her songs that he sang, those of you who knew him, he sang passionately, although he couldn't carry a tune. Um, and he, uh, but didn't stop him. And <laughs> thankfully, he loved song. And through song, he learned Hebrew. And so we supported each other in speaking Hebrew to our children. And as my great-grandfather wrote, so, so it was, what one lacked the other provided. Um, uh, we quickly learned that you can't just say masa'it to a three-year-old boy. There are about 100 different kinds of trucks. And so I, we needed to know the difference between a garbage truck <laughs> and a bulldozer and all of that. So it was very uh, rich and uh, technical vocabulary <laughs> about till the age of five. Um, and uh, we, uh, because we were students here at JTS at the time, our eldest really did not speak English until he went to preschool. We were lucky enough to have babysitters who were JTS students. And although our Hebrew was completely American in its accent, he somehow spoke English 
with an Israeli <laughs> accent. <laughs> Once he was speaking English, of course, it was harder to maintain that um, Hebrew atmosphere in the home for our subsequent children. But I think our goal was for them to internalize the language, internalize the, lang the grammar, the structure, and of course, the contagion for um, Hebrew for our, and, and our love for Hebrew until they got to school, at which point they would begin to study it more formally. And, and I think that we have been able to do that. Um, I will close by opening up a conversation that Nessa and I touched on when we uh, were preparing for this. And that, of course, is the role of Israel in, in uh, Hebrew culture here in the United States. Um, because I, I do feel that part of what was important for me to do was for, the, for um, our kids to feel comfortable enough to be able to be comfortable in Israel. Um, my older daughter is now married to an Israeli. I have no doubt that theirs will be a Hebrew home. <laughs> um, but it, it will be supported by one, one of the adults who is um, native, a native speaker of Hebrew, and one who, you know, they, they, when they really need to communicate, they speak Hebrew, not English. And I'm enormously proud of that. And I'm sure that our own Shimon Shbal would have been thrilled. Yeah. <laughs> um, we'd be happy to take a few comments or questions or if anybody else here grew up in a Hebrew speaking home that would be interesting to hear I just want to report that when I was about six years old my father started me writing to my grandfather in Atlanta in Hebrew and my grandfather spoke Yiddish, and I didn't know Yiddish. And I always communicated much better with him through writing in Hebrew. And he wrote all his books in Hebrew. And he would send the letters back to me corrected. And I have them. I have them. So uh, they were cut from the same cloth. Yeah, yeah. So. The term Mishugala Davar definitely yeah. <laughs> is necessary. <laughs> well, yes. Thank you, Shlomo. Any, anybody else? Well, yes. One of the, um, Epi, is that Epi? Yes. Could you stand up and yes. project? Yeah. <laughs> you know, one of the highlights of the, uh, one of the highlights of the TI experience uh, hasn't been mentioned today, but that was those of us who spent here in Israel, most especially at the Hong Kong. You know, when I tell people, who are teachers who are right here, they, they really don't believe me. People think I'm, my students think I'm making it up. Because my poetry teacher was Yudha Bikai, my prose teacher was uh, Aaron Appleton, or our drum wow. teacher was Michelle and Chancellor, who wrote that to the type of and our drum. Now, the Wolfgang teacher was the father of the Wolfgang. Uh, it was an, an incredible experience, and it was the first year that I think, aside from my years at the seminary, First year that true Hebrew scholarship became alive for me, uh, especially in the reading room at uh, Harasopin. So I think uh, it was not Harasopin. It, it was not. It was not. It was Well, uh, it was there, but yeah, there was, yeah, but you weren't there. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, I think that that immersion was uh, was uh, of inestimable value, and it makes me think that somewhere out there.
another very tiny, probably one of the only ones who knows about it, a tiny girls' school on the island of Java, uh, which is a total immersion school. So I think you have to sort of reach like that. Uh, well, I want to say one thing to yeah, that, which is those of us who spent time in Israel uh, we're always amazed that somehow, at least for my generation, Argentinian Jews all spoke Hebrew. Right. So it wasn't only that you had to be in some rarefied elite yes. setting. Uh, we just failed compared to other countries that had a Hold tradition on. of another language. The, I'm going to make American sociological comment. Go ahead. Sociological comment. That is an American problem. Yes. Americans yes. speak English. They expect everybody else to speak English. Uh, it, English is the lingua franca, mm -hmm. and uh, we we um, think it's amazing when somebody learns a second language, much less you know in Belgium where they speak three languages or four languages, and I I think that it may not be a Jewish problem in us; it's an American problem, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't work at it. Yes, Mayor. <coughs> He got up and I was sitting next to him in the Asbury. And he goes, I feel the Now I had spent five years in Israel as a kid going to elementary school and high school. And I turned to Sylvia, I said, Anima Kabesh, Lomadabin Kapabab. That's really the problem that we have. Is that if you're not living the language in the land in the country where the language Spoken. Your Hebrew speaking here is not going to reflect that, and we have to find some way of bringing the two together, because biblical Hebrew is not spoken there, and well, American Hebrew, and the famous things about Ramah. You know, we had a Hanukkah. All the Israelis would come and say, "What's a Hanukkah?" Uh, right in my side, we had a Simriah. Yes, Simriah. I know. Three but you know, all these things. We have to find some way. Wants uh, to when I to when uh, the in my teen and uh, you know early adulthood, when I would go to Israel, uh, w as soon as I would speak Hebrew, Israelis would inevitably say, "Oh, Ivrit Shel Shabbat." Ivrit Shel Shabbat. Lamadat mi Bialik. But I took it as a compliment, and really, you know, uh, it, it's not so far afield when you. But you're right, unless you're actually living immersed in the culture, it doesn't necessarily progress to where you want it to. But to have that background, I, I, I take Ivri Chal Shabbat That should day. be our biggest problem. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, one more, I suppose. I think you want to have a break before the next session, please. Mm -hmm. I think I grew up with the father who was like your father's and grandfather's <laughs> and great grandfather's because his dedication was to Oh, 
if you could only hear it in the original. Mm -hmm. And 1939, 1940, <gasps> I, no, no, not Yiddish, Hebrew, only Hebrew, Brat Libri, not the teachers, the students. And I threw my hands up and said, do I choose my mother or my father? <laughs> <laughs> I made no choices. I continued both. I got into difficulty with this only in Israel, where I was coming on a visit to my children and discussed whatever it was with the person interviewing me in Hebrew, at which point the question arose. Uh, no, no. <laughs> it's a great so story. I had a very difficult time getting out of that, but it was an enormous improvement because in the first years when I went to Israel, I didn't